So um, we're very fortunate, and I'm very pleased to uh, 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 have Ursula Jakob here today. Um, Ursula got her PhD at Regensburg University in Germany, and then uh, she moved to the University of Michigan, where she did, a, did her postdoctoral studies, and then became an assistant professor there and has risen to the ranks to become a full professor now in the Department of Molecular, Cellular, and Developmental Biology. And if you uh, regularly read Ursula's papers, you'll find that they're always very exciting, innovative, creative papers. She really takes a, a different tack on things from other people. It's not the same old stuff, and I think we're in for a, an exciting seminar. Um, so, Ursula? Thank you very much, Rui, for hosting this visit. So I will turn off. Oh, what is this for me? This is great. Okay, so I'll just put this on here. all know that living an aerobic life can be quite treacherous. We constantly produce reactive oxygen species in the mitochondria during respiration, uh, superoxide anions. We also produce superoxide anions um, as byproducts of various enzymes, including NADPH oxidases. Now, the superoxide gets very rapidly dismuted to H2O2 by superoxide dismutases. And the H2O2 itself, although very oxidizing, is actually fairly non-reactive. Of all these species, it's probably the most harmless um, of all these reactive oxygen species. What makes it so toxic is the moment H2O2 reacts with iron or copper, fenton metals, and converts into these extremely reactive hydroxyl radicals which then attack proteins, lipids, and DNA. And so when you look at this, it doesn't pick, it's uh, not surprising that uh, we pay our costs for living an aerobic lifestyle. And accumulation of reactive oxygen species, as well as reactive chlorine species, and I will talk more about that later, uh, causes a condition we all are very well aware of. It's called oxidative stress. And this oxidative stress has been associated with many different uh, pathological conditions, such as inflammation, metabolic diseases, such as diabetes, neurodegenerative diseases, and, of course, you're all very well aware, aging. So this is Barack Obama before he took office. <laughs> this is Barack Obama six years after exposure to both reactive oxygen species and the American public. Okay. So I apologize for that. There's a figure here, but that's not here. It's never happened to me before. But uh, what it says here, and I hope that we don't have more of those figures missing, um, of course, it's also necessary to live an aerobic lifestyle. And this is not just because we need oxygen to breathe, of course, but it is because we have a large number of proteins now um, that are responsive to reactive oxygen species. And if you had this figure, it would show you that we have kinases, phosphatases, transcriptional regulators that are very sensitive to the presence of reactive oxygen and nitrogen species and regulate their activity. And so what is clear now is that we need reactive oxygen species for development, differentiation, and growth. And when you look at this, then it becomes clear that we need actually a very fine homeostasis. It's now clear that too much reactive oxygen species are not good because they cause cellular random, so random cellular damage and cause aging disease and cell death. But too little reactive oxygen species is also not good because it does impair proliferative processes. It does impair host defenses. So we need to have a very fine homeostasis between production of reactive oxygen species and detoxification. And when you look at this, it becomes now also clear why we often ha do not get the expected results uh, when we do genetic interventions, for instance, in aging studies. So aging, it has been long thought that oxidative stress is the underlying culprit of aging. And so when you think about that, you would say, well, now that we can do all these genetic interventions, let's just overexpress superoxide dismutase, get rid of all the superoxide that should the prediction would be that the organisms live longer. Or if we delete them all, all these superoxide dismutases, we should accumulate more reactive oxygen species 
the organisms should live shorter. And while it works in some cases, it doesn't work in other cases. And I think it's because we have these various functions of reactive oxygen species and just completely depleting reactive oxygen species from cells and organisms is, not, is actually also fairly detrimental. At the center of all those uh, redox-regulated processes are redox-sensitive proteins. Um, so what most of those redox-sensitive proteins have in common is the presence of one or more cysteine residues that are very sensitive to oxidative modification. When they encounter reactive oxygen or nitrogen species that get reversibly oxidized, it can be a sulfonation, it can be a glutathionylation, a cysteinylation, and in either case, the protein changes its structure and usually its function. And it gets either activated or inactivated by the oxidative modification of those cysteines. And this oxidative modification and the um, changes in activity can either be direct if the cysteine is, for instance, in an active site or involved in zinc binding and then forms disulfide the bonds and it no longer binds zinc or it can be a change in the proteolytic stability of the protein. It can be a change in the, in the subcellular uh, localization of the protein. In either case, it changes the function. And then we have dedicated systems in the cell that reduce those oxidative bile modifications and bring the proteins back to their original functional state. And so these redox-regulated processes together with the fact that reactive oxygen species such as peroxide are signaling, considered as good signaling molecules, makes redox regulation really now on par with phosphorylation, dephosphorylation reactions. Very fast, very rapid, major changes in signal transcription cascades in the activity. For instance, P10 phosphatase is rapidly inactivated by oxidative stress. That means the kinase pathway is activated. And so, but this is all very rapid and is fully reversible. So we thought, well, those cysteines are very sensitive to oxidation. These are probably the first proteins that respond to oxidative modification. So if we can monitor the oxidation status of those redox-sensitive cysteines in vivo, we will have a readout when in a cell do oxidants start to increase, affect the cysteines of those proteins, and potentially affect physiological functions. And we thought this is superior over the commonly used way to assess oxidative stress or oxidative damage, which is carbonylation which is a nonspecific formation of aldehydes in proteins, and you use a Western blot analysis to just see an increase or decrease in, in carbonylation. But the problem with carbonylation is it can be one protein molecule that's carbonylated at 100 sites or 100 molecules carbonylated at one site, you get the same signal. So you cannot really say what is the extent. We don't know where the carbonylations are, how it affects the physiology, and so on. Well, looking at those redox-sensitive proteins that are the first responders to changes in the oxidative levels should uh, be a very sensitive readout. So as a proof of concept, we, develop, or we developed a, a technique that allows us now to quantitatively describe oxidative bile modifications in vivo. We call this OxICAT because we use ICAT technology from the uh, maspic world to look at the oxidation status in vivo. So ICAT is a, uh, is a label that irreversibly attacks cysteines, labels them, and it comes in an isotopically light and in an isotopically heavy form, with the isotopically heavy form being nine Dalton heavier. And then it has a biotin tag for purification. So what we now do, and we can do this in E. coli, we can do it in yeast, in Z. elegans, in cell culture, in tissues. We take the, the tissue, uh, denature it um, in a very high uh, concentration of urea to expose all the free cysteines that are reduced in vivo and label them with the light version of the ICAD reagent irreversibly. So all the reduced cysteines in vivo are labeled light. Then we reduce all reversible thiol modifications with a strong reductant and label all newly reduced cysteines that were originally oxidized with the heavy version of the ICAD reagent. So at the end, 
we have now a, a protein solution where the cysteines that when they were reduced are labeled light and when the cysteines were oxidized they will be labeled heavy and a nine Dalton heavier um, uh, per cysteine that's in this protein. We then triptychally digest the protein and then purify only these ICAT labeled peptides which massively reduces sample complexity and then analyze them by LC and MS analysis. And what we are seeing here is uh, two peaks, uh, which are exactly nine Dalton apart from each other, if the, cyst if the peptide has one cysteine. And so because those peptides are chemically absolutely identical, they fly to absolutely the same extent. And you can now quantify the precise ratio of reduced to oxidized thiol in vivo. Of course, with mass spec, you can determine what is the peptide, what is the protein, what is the cysteine, and you can say, well, this cysteine and that protein is 5% oxidized under non-stress condition and 35% oxidized under certain stress condition. And then you can say, well, where is the cysteine? Is this conserved? Is it playing a structural functional role? And from that, you can conclude whether this oxidative modification has any physiological consequence. So can we use this now to obtain a redox proteomic view of the cell? We've done this with E. coli, and here I just show you a proof of concept that we can also do it in yeast, and we can also do it in C. elegans. And so what you see here is about 400 protein thiols, different protein thiols in all different locations of the cell. And what you see here is that the majority of proteins are largely, the protein thiols are largely reduced. This is what we expect. We have a few proteins that are highly oxidized. Most of those are secreted proteins that have stable disulfabonds. And then we have a group of protein thiols that show this intermediate oxidation status. And depending on how we grow yeast, more fermentative or more respiratory, we can change the oxidation state of those proteins to more, towards more reducing or towards being more oxidized. So they are good redox-sensitive cysteine thiols. We can do the same in, in C. elegans, and you will see more data about C. elegans in a moment. Again, we see a very similar trend with the majority of fully disulfide proteins being secreted due to the presence of um, stable disulfide bonds. Now, of course, the next question is now we have nicely, we can reconstitute redox sensitive pathways in that. We can treat now either yeast or C. elegans with peroxide or other stresses and see what are the proteins that are actually changing and to what extent. And I give you only one example that how the data look. This is um, the ribo pro, uh, ribosomal protein L7. It, this is the peptide that we identified. It has one cysteine that's fully conserved. Um, and the cysteine is largely reduced under non-stress conditions. You incubate your worms in sublethal concentrations of H2O2, and you get more than 50% of that cysteine oxidized. And so you can do this on a proteome wide. Um, yeah, you can do this proteome wide and find out what are the pathways that are most sensitive to H2O2. What are the pathways that are most sensitive to other stressors? So, and based on those results, we concluded that. Uh, we, sh we find at least uh, 10 to 20 percent of proteins that we can identify, uh, whose styles we can identify, show substantially increased levels of oxidative modification. So they have redox sensitive cysteines. Um, and these affect translation, ATP generation, motility, which is interesting because when you take a C. elegans and treat with sublethal concentrations of H2O2, they stop translating proteins or they decrease their translational properties. They very much decrease their ATP levels and they stop moving for the first day or two. Many of those thiol oxidation, uh, thiol modifications are highly conserved. So we find uh, proteins that we find with redox-sensitive cysteines in yeast and C. elegans and in mice. So this is CDC48, elongation factor, which uh, confirms to us that those cysteines are indeed uh, redox-sensitive for a reason and uh, most likely redox-sensitive in other organisms as well. And we decided that those proteins serve as good bi potentially good biomarkers to give us an in vivo readout for oxidative stress levels or for, for conditions that lead to tr transient peroxide accumulation in vivo. Um, 
And so with that established, we thought, well, now we can actually look at the free radical, revisit the free radical theory of aging and say, okay, when do we actually see over the lifespan of an organism when oxidant levels increase? Is it just during the aging process? Is it at any other point in life? And so, again, we went back to C. elegans because C. elegans is, of course, a great model organism for aging. You all know it can be easily synchronized, which is nice for redox proteomic studies. It has aging phenotypes. At least some of the genes that have been found to affect lifespan have been found to affect lifespan in other organisms as well. And it has this beautiful aging phenotypes that you can monitor. And so we thought, well, if we monitor now these redox-sensitive proteins that we see to get more oxidized, if we have actually peroxide stresses at any time during the lifespan, we should see that. We should see the higher oxidation of those proteins. So that should give us an idea about the onset of oxidative stress that's physiologically relevant, and also the extent. And so we thought, well, and then, of course, we can maybe correlate that to the lifespan of the organisms. So we took five time points for those measurements. And for those of you who are not that familiar with C. elegans, we took time points during larval development, L2 and L4. It's a time where most people are actually not looking for when they do aging studies. We took day two. This is when the worms just started to mature. They are the ones that go out and lay eggs and are really active and happy. At day 10 or 8, we took samples. This is the time when they stop laying eggs. So this is our first real aging phenotype. So uh, it's an age-related uh, phenotype, or not phenotype, but it's age-related that they stop laying eggs. But they still all move. And then we took sample, a sample at day 15 where they stop moving. So they just lie there and lift their head and are really no longer very happy. And then eventually they die, but at that point still 80% of the worms our life. So we have a number of different uh, phenotypical traits that we can look at, or behavioral traits. So we took the samples, did our oxycat analysis, and looked at about 150 protein thiols uh, at all these different stages. And so what we found was, yes, we see more oxidation as the worms age. And I just guide you through this. What you see here is the number of peptides that have a certain oxidation status, and you see those, the majority of them are reduced. You saw those before in a different scheme. And then as the, pro, as the C. elegans gets older, you get more uh, peptides with higher oxidation states. So that's something, well, that's been expected. What was completely unexpected, however, was the fact that we have a significantly higher accumulation of oxidized protein thiols during development. And then what you see here is between L4, so the last larva stage, and day two, all those proteins get reduced again. And so that was very surprising uh, because, I mean, of course, nobody really ever looked at the oxidative stress level that uh, worms have or organisms have during the development. And it looked like that they were able to fully recover from that, maintain the reduced state, and then slowly get oxidized again. Now, of course, we have no idea right now where this peroxide comes from in development, but we argue that it's probably metabolism, signaling, all these things that happen during the growth of C. elegans. So just so that you see um, how this then looks on an individual protein basis, um, this is color-coded. So these are individual cysteines that we identified, the proteins, and then the oxidation status during these different stages. And you see always beautifully how it's fairly high during L2, L4, then it goes down, and then it slowly goes up again. And this is for all of those 20 or so proteins that we found. And when we looked at those proteins, we saw that many of those proteins we found previously to be sensitive to H2O2. So all of those had H2O2 sensitive cysteines. And we thought, well, at least some extent of oxidation might be conferred by peroxide in those worms. And so we thought this is great because worms are transparent and we have peroxide sensor proteins that we can use to directly now monitor on an individual worm basis how much peroxide do they actually encounter during development and in the aging process. And this is what we did next. We went on to using these in vivo sensor proteins um, 
that send specifically reactive oxygen species such as H2O2. So we are using HYPER. This is the second generation of raw sensors. Uh, there are now third generation ones out that are even more, have even a higher dynamic range. But what they are is there's uh, circular permutated YFPs that are linked to the reactive cysteines of OXIR, which is the H2O2 specific uh, regulator in bacteria. And the moment that disulfide bond forms, which only forms in the presence of H2O2, this y, see if the circular permittivity by if P sh changes its conformation, and with that changes the emission at two excitation maxima. It goes up here and down here. And this is a ratiometric approach, which is really nice because it doesn't depend on the relative expression level of that protein and tissue. So you can study them over time, you can study them in various tissues, at least as long as you have some expression, this, uh, the ratio of hype is independent of the amount of protein, and it just depends on the amount of H2O2 that is present. So we thought, well, peroxide, we saw that some of these proteins are peroxide sensitive. Let's see, do we actually see, can we sense peroxide in vivo? So we um, put the hypersensor into the body wall muscle. This is here, this is an injection marker. Um, because we thought, well, we see these muscle-specific proteins that are peroxide-sensitive, um, and we see them oxidized both in young, very young, and very old worms, so we look at this. And then at this, uh, a few months later, or a year later, we heard of another hyperworm that Mark Pregman uh, constructed where he, con he expressed hyper uh, ubiquitously in the whole worm with very high expression levels. So we thought that's great. So we can look at two different lines and see whether whatever we see is system-wide or is, is restricted to certain tissues. So what we then did, uh, what uh, we then did was we, we took samples again at various time points in a synchronized population and looked at individual worms and measured their hyper ratio. And so when we look at, again, at the adulthood, we see pretty nicely what we also saw with our OxyCat, that we see an increase in hyper levels. This is in the head region of that worm. We don't see it as much in the body wall muscle, but I think it's because the expression levels get so, so close to zero when the worms get so old that we are really biasing these last, exper these last data points for worms that are still fairly happy and fairly healthy. But so we saw this, which was very nice because it was nicely consistent with our OxyCAD data. And then we looked at the development, and sure enough, what we found was this huge accumulation of peroxide in the worms during development fully consistent with our proteomic data. And what you even see here is that you have two populations, one where the peroxide levels are still high, and then one where the peroxide levels get already down. So this was very exciting because it suggests that there's something going on during development. And this was consistent with work by Andy Dillon, who uh, manipulated the mitochondrial output just during the developmental phase of C. elegans, and that extended lifespan. So there was something that happens during development in C. elegans that can, if it's applied just during development, affect the lifespan of the organism. So we thought, well, is there any correlation to lifespan? So we tested a few mutants. We made some crosses. We crossed our hypermutant into mutants that are effective in the insulin signaling pathway. Um, this is the insulin receptor. This is DAF2. If you uh, knock out DEF2, DEF16, FOXO goes into the nucleus and transcribes uh, these stress-resistant genes. And you see beautifully how DEF2 mutants show an increase in lifespan. If you knock out DEF16, you see a decrease in lifespan. So we thought, well, how do they look? Do they also have high levels of oxidants during development? And they do. So we don't see much of a difference between those worms, so color-coded, red is short-lived, green is wild-type, and blue is the long-lived one here, just for reference. You don't see much of a difference, but you see the first difference becomes apparent in this, or the main difference comes, becomes apparent in this transition phase from recovering from the high peroxide levels in, in the development to the adulthood where they reduce their peroxide levels, presumably to be um, 
to be having a very reducing environment for egg laying and so on. And so what you see here is that the short-lived worm, they never fully recover from this peroxide uh, accumulation here, while the long-lived ones actually start to recover earlier. And while the long-lived one, you never really see any increase up to day 23 of the lifespan, the short-lived ones are already highly oxidized much earlier than wild type. So, of course, this is just a correlation, and, but it, it showed to us that there is at least, we can say that if worms are better able to deal with the reactive oxygen species, or that longer-lived worms are better able to deal with the higher peroxide levels during development. So, what then, what then came to our mind was another observation that was actually done uh, by Shane Weir and Johnston, who found that when they take worms at day one of adulthood and look at the expression of a uh, GFP protein uh, that's under the control of a heat shock promoter, they can sort the worms then and they, there's a correlation between that expression level and their lifespan. And that's at day one of adulthood. So now we have the idea we can manipulate mitochondrial output during development, affect lifespan. Something in worms at day one of adulthood has already imprinted their lifespan. And then we looked at the ROS levels and we looked at the extreme variability that we saw within an isogenic population. And you see this again here where you see this is an isogenic population of C. elegans at L3, L4 stage. They are all the same. They're grown on the same plates. They have the same food. Everything is the same. Yet one of those worms has a very, very low level of H2O2 and one has a very high level of H2O2. And remember, worms, some of those worms live only three or four days and the other ones live 30 days. And so the, this raised in the idea could it be that those variations in these early peroxide levels differentially affect redox-regulated processes, such as transcriptional epigenetic processes, and with that potentially individualize lifespan? Because that would also agree with the Johnston work. And so, of course, this is not so simple to test, but uh, we are at the, at the beginning stages of testing the theory does that early life uh, or peroxide levels determine lifespan. So what we're doing now in collaboration with Union Biometrica, we are using a biosorter that sorts the worms. And unfortunately, most all of the biosorters only sort by fluorescence, not by ratiometric uh, measurements. But we convinced Union Biometrica to change the setup of one of their biosorters, and they are actually now doing a ratiometric measurement. And so we sorted the worms into low, medium, and high hyper ratios at L3, plated them, uh, separated them, and then shipped them to an arbor where we tested them in the confocal and confirmed, yes, there is a difference in, um, in these batch sorted worms. And then we looked at their lifespan. And what we found was, so here you see with the confocal where we looked at some of the batches of worms, those with the much lower uh, average hyper ratio with the higher ones. And we see a statistically significant difference in the lifespan of worms, suggesting that those worms with a lower average of peroxide during <laughs> early development have a longer lifespan. Now, of course, we have to repeat those experiments. These are still unpublished and very preliminary. We have now also developed individual, so a, bi, a, a microfluidic worm sorter where we can individually sort the worms. We can measure their hyper ratio and then put them onto individual plates and then individually look at their lifespan. And our overall goal is, of course, to then look at these individual worms that have such differences in their peroxide levels and see what are the transcriptional changes, are these changes inherited, what is the lifespan of the progenies, and so on. But this is just the beginning. So with that, I would like to just summarize this first part of my talk. Uh, I think I showed you now that we have quantitative methods that we can use to determine and reconstitute, if, the, if you have the financial support, uh, the whole redox network.
um, I mean, the, the methods are sensitive enough. It's just a matter of uh, money to do that. So we, if you do enough repetitions, you can really analyze and get the majority of redox-sensitive proteins. We can monitor spatial and temporal changes that occur. Of course, we find the targets of these oxidants. We can reveal when increases in raw levels might become lifespan determining. And our ultimate hope is that we, divide, that we find out the correct window of time where we can manipulate the levels of reactive oxygen species and with that manipulate the lifespan. Now the last 10 or 15 minutes or so, I would like to switch a little gear and want to talk about the benefits of living an aerobic lifestyle. And I don't know whether you've seen this movie. It's been 50 years old or so. But this is a neutrophil chasing a bacterium. And I promise you it will catch it. It takes a while. So it's not the fastest, but it's, it's coming almost. So these are red blood cells. And now, yep, almost, almost. Uh, uh, yes, now, now, that's it. OK, gone it is. So. What happens in these neutrophils is that they use an ADPH oxidase to make superoxide, and we talked about that already, convert that into H2O2. But now these neutrophils con uh, contain an enzyme called myeloperoxidase, which converts the H2O2, combines it with chloride ions, and makes bleach, hypochlorous acid, a very reactive chlorine species. There's another enzyme, duox, which is expressed in our bronchi and in our intestine that also produces bleach. And it has been shown in a beautiful study in Drosophila that uh, if you knock down duox, the uh, flies have an overgrowth, a bacterial overgrowth in the gut and die prematurely of infections. So this means that we don't only use bleach to disinfect our countertops, and Americans love bleach. When I give this talk in Europe, they look at me and say, bleach, bleach. I say, it's the chlorine in the swimming pool. They don't use bleach. Americans love bleach. Anyway, so um, we don't just use it in our count on our countertops, but we have these little bleach factories that, uh, that swim around and try to kill bacteria. So, of course, the next question was, how does bleach kill bacteria? And you wonder how it's doing that. And despite the fact that American households used bleach for over 200 years, we didn't know actually what is going on in bacteria that kills uh, or by how they are killed. And what turns out, what are really the major targets of bleach are the proteins. So they are very abundant, of course, and they're incredibly reactive. When we talk about oxidation of cysteine thiols by H2O2, that's about six orders of magnitude slower than the reaction rate of cysteine thiols with bleach. So bleach reacts six orders of magnitude faster with cysteine thiols than H2O2. It also causes, um, so it causes chlorination, sulfonylation, disulfide bond formation. It attacks iron sulfur centers. Um, and it leads ultimately to both degradation as well as severe protein aggregation. And I always compare that, that bleach is essentially boiling, uh, boiling proteins or boiling an egg at room temperature. That's basically what bleach does. Now, bacteria are also not stupid. They came up with a fairly clever strategy to counteract the toxic effects of bleach. And they use a molecular chaperone. So many of you heard, of course, of the beautiful work that Rui is doing here with chaperones. And so the chaperone is uh, fairly bacteria-specific. We also have it in a few unicellular parasites. And it, too, gets oxidatively modified, gets partially unfolded. But in this case, it needs this partial unfolding to become stress-specifically activated as a chaperone. And so... Uh, this is the, the model that we have now, and I don't want to go into too much detail here. The four absolutely conserved cysteines in HSP33, there's a zinc ion that makes those cysteines very reactive. When bleach comes along, those two, the four cysteines form two intramolecular disulfide bonds. The zinc is released. The zinc binding domain partially unfolds, as does this green linker domain, and then exposes surfaces that bind to unfolding proteins. We can monitor that in vitro. Here's a typical activity assay, reduced 
HSP33 is inactive, oxidized HSP33 is 100% active, and we can look at it in vivo where we see that strains that lack HSP33 are very sensitive to bleach stress. So from those results, we concluded, well, bacteria have developed HSP33 that specifically, stress specifically, gets activated under bleach stress. And this makes a lot of sense. First of all, you don't have a lot of protein translation under oxidative stress. We talked about this already. And HSP33 doesn't need to be newly translated. It's just there. It's just there in an inactive state. Secondly, it makes a lot of sense because it works ATP independently. And I told you before, every organism that we and others have tested show a massive drop in ATP levels the moment they're oxidatively stressed. And so ATP-dependent chaperones such as HSP70 don't work under those conditions. So an HSP33 is an ATP-independent chaperone, doesn't need ATP, and can hence interact with those unfolding proteins, prevent their aggregation, and then transfer eventually their protein, their substrates, to the DNA case system when the non-stress conditions are restored. Now you might wonder, where does the ATP go? And we now, I think we have a pretty good idea of where the ATP goes in bacteria. We still don't know whether it's the same for eukaryotes. But the common uh, notion was, oh, enzymes in glycolysis, GAP-DH, um, all those enzymes are so sensitive to oxidation. GAP-DH is one of the first proteins that gets oxidized to 70 80%. If that blocks glycolysis. You don't have glycolysis. You don't produce as much ATP. What I will show you in the last 10 or so minutes is that in bacteria, at least, the ATP does not, is not depleted because of a lack of glycolysis, but because they actively redirect ATP into polyphosphate. Now, who of you have heard of polyphosphate? <laughs> because we talked about it today. <laughs> Rui, you have heard, yeah? So, three people. Okay, so if you were... 20 or 30 years older, you would have heard all about polyphosphate, because, particularly if you ever heard Arthur Kornberg talking, the late Arthur Kornberg, who spent the last 15 years on studying polyphosphate, called it the forgotten polymer, and claimed it's the most important molecule in the universe. Okay? I think also it's important, but I don't think it's the most important one. But anyway, so... Polyphosphate is present in every organism that it has been tested for, in bacteria, in uh, eukaryotes, in mammalian cells. It's produced at super high concentrations at, uh, for blood clotting. It's being released by thrombocytes to induce the blood clotting. It's uh, in every organism that have been tested. It confers stress resistance. So it's a very important protein, uh, very important. It forms these metachromatic granules here. It's isoenergetic with ATP, so it's just phosphate connected with other phosphates by, by a phosphoanhydride bridge. So it's the same energy as ATP. Um, and it is a very, very ancient molecule. So this molecule has been there since prebiotic times and is still constantly produced at uh, volcanoes, phosphate rocks when you heat it up. It makes this high energy ATP-related compound called polyphosphate, okay? And what I will show you over the next uh, 10 minutes is that this polyphosphate is what we believe a primordial chaperone. It's the chaperone that probably helped the first proteins to fold, and that might solve the riddle what came first when you need a chaperone to fold proteins. So how did we come up with this idea that polyphosphate works as a chaperone? Well, um, we made one observation, namely that when we treated E. coli with bleach, they were severely phosphate starved. And that was a very surprising observation because of all the molecules, phosphate is the least reactive with bleach. So every assay that we do is with phosphate because it does not react with bleach. Yet the bacteria had all the signs of phosphate starvation. And we thought, where does the phosphate go? And so a um, emeritus professor of microbiology who heard Arthur Kornberg many times talks that maybe it's in polyphosphate. And so we tested this, and there's a very easy essay for polyphosphate. You just stop stain your, gel, your uh, cells, 
and you use a different uh, filter set um, to see it. And you see very nicely with hypochlorous acid, you see the polyphosphate accumulating in those cells. Now, this is how polyphosphate is made. We have a polyphosphate kinase that elongates the chain uh, one uh, phosphate at a time using ATP. And this is the PPX, the phosphatase that degrades polyphosphate into inorganic phosphate. We can measure the polyphosphate accumulation in bacteria in response to bleach, and you see beautifully how it gets um, increased immediately after bleach treatment. You do not see this in a strain that is deleted for PPK, and you see a little bit more accumulation in PPX. It turns out the PPX is redox regulated. It has a cysteine in its active site where polyphosphate binds. And this redox regulation causes the inactivation of PPX for the first 60 or so minutes after the bleach stress, after which then in PPX the cysteine gets re-reduced, and that's why the cells level out in their polyphosphate. Now, of course, now that we had a strain that could make polyphosphate, the wild type in a strain that could no longer make polyphosphate, we could address the question, is this where the ATP goes in the cells that are oxidatively stressed? And so what we did was we took wild type E. coli, uh, treated them with sublethal concentrations of bleach, so all these bleach concentrations, wild type survives, and you see this very rapid, massive drop in ATP levels. And in a PPK deletion strain, you don't see that drop. So they stay still very high until this concentration, where they, until this time where they start to die off. And this brings me to the next uh, experiment where we found, and this has been shown before, not for bleach, but for other stress conditions, that strains that lack polyphosphate are super stress sensitive. So this is a strain that can no longer make polyphosphate. That's 30 minutes of bleach treatment. These are the most bleach-sensitive strains that we have in our lab. So in a strain that uh, expresses, um, accumulates more PPX is slightly more resistant. So now, of course, we concluded, well, yes, polyphosphate is important for protecting cells. They actively redirect ATP, so it's not a passive non-specific effect of speech, they actively redirect poly, uh, uh, ATP into polyphosphate, and they need to do that to survive bleach stress. And so now we were exactly where Arthur Kornberg was, trying to figure out how it's working. And so we decided we let E. coli tell us what's going on and look at gene expression, uh, particularly stress-specific genes. And so we tested for... Uh, we tested for DNA repair or stress responses. We couldn't find any significant difference in the upregulation, but what we did find that a strain that lacks polyphosphate had all those chaffins upregulated. HSLO is the gene name for HSP33. Remember the bleach-specific uh, chaffron in E. coli, IBPS, small heterotrophic protein, HSP70. All of them were much higher upregulated in strains that lacked polyphosphate in response to bleach. And so what we concluded from those experiments was that these cells must experience some additional unfolding protein, unfolding stress that they could not deal with in the absence of polyphosphate. And so uh, and we thought, well, maybe polyphosphate works either directly or indirectly as a chaperone. And so we thought, well, there's so many ways that it could do this in vivo. Why don't we simplify our whole system, go in vitro, and test whether purified polyphosphate affects the folding um, of proteins. And so what, we see, what you see here is um, a cell lysis of E. coli that we just treated with heat, and you see all the proteins that aggregate after this heat treatment. Mm -hmm. And now we increase our polyphosphate concentration, and you see with high enough polyphosphate concentration, there is no significant protein aggregation. This is poly P specific. We can use spermidine and other poly N ions. They do not show this effect. We can even simplify that further and say, well, we take one protein of which we know it rapidly aggregates when we treat it with bleach. This is citrate synthesis, and we can beautifully monitor the light scattering. When, when we treat citrate synthesis with bleach, we do this in the presence of polyphosphate. We decrease the light scattering. 
What was probably for me the most astounding result was this one, where we took luciferase, which is a very commonly used Chaplin substrate that aggregates rapidly at 45 degrees. And when we incubate that now at 85 degrees in the absence of polyphosphate, you see at 20 degrees everything is soluble, at 85 degrees everything is insoluble. You do this in the presence of 0.3 millimolar polyphosphate, and that's per phosphate unit, okay? Everything is soluble. So this polyphosphate maintains a protein soluble for 20-minute incubation at 85 degrees. And luciferase is not the only one. We've tried the same thing with other purified proteins. We see very similar results. And moreover, it is really an active part of the Chaperon system in bacteria. So this is when we take luciferase and incubate it at 40 degrees. We see the inactivation and we stabilize this with polyphosphate. And then what we do is we switch the temperature and add the an ATP dependent chaperone system. And what you see is that now only those, the luciferase that was pre incubated with polyphosphate refolds. And we can do this, we can trigger the refolding just by adding PPK here that converts polyphosphate back into ATP. And that ATP then fuels this DNA KHAE system for refolding, having a complete cycle. Yes? That cut. Very good question. That comes in my next slide, which is my last data slide. As Veronica pointed out, there are different chain lengths of polyphosphate, and different organisms make different chain lengths, and they range all the way from 30 to up to 1,000 phosphates in a chain. And so we wanted to know is there dependence of the uh, efficacy of, the ch uh, of polyphosphate. And that was particularly important because now, of course, we want to know how this works. And if it's simply a binding event, then you would expect there shouldn't be a difference between a 15 mer and a 300 mer, or if it was a bringing ions close to the protein. But what we see here is a substantial effect on the chain length. So citrate synthase, this is 50 micromolar chain length. Um, that's the longest one with 300 phosphate monomer phosphates. This one, the blue one, is with 13 phosphates. The same is true for luciferase. Here, of course, you need much, much less. Luciferase is the exquisitely reactive to polyphosphate. It's five nanomolar of long chains prevent the aggregation of 85 nanomolar of luciferase. And we see this also in citrate synthesis. When we incubate citrate synthesis now at 85 degrees in the presence of polyphosphate, the long chains keep it completely soluble by the uh, shorter chains don't. So there's clearly a specificity, and it's the longer the chains, the better they work. And this is what you see also here with the chain length. You get a better protective effect. And so with that, I come to the conclusion of that part of my talk. So what we think what happens is that when cells are bleach stressed, um, they activate post-translationally HSP33, activate that, that prevents protein aggregation. At the same time, they block uh, the phosphatase, um, which allows ATP to be converted into polyphosphate. And we still don't know what stimulates PPK, the enzyme that makes the polyphosphate. But in either case, not having the PPX around explains why we are phosphate starved, why we observe the phosphate starvation, because that's the enzyme that produces the inorganic phosphate. Now, the polyphosphate is isoenergetic to ATP, so it's really a storage an energy storage, and now can scaffold maybe or have some scaffolding action that protects a large number of proteins against aggregation, keeping them soluble. And when we return to non-stress condition, the PPK can reconvert polyphosphate into ATP, and we reconstituted this in vitro, which then fuels these ATP-dependent chaperone systems that do no longer work because ATP is lacking under those stress conditions, fuels those proteins to refold them to the native state. Now, of course, our, the big question now for us is how does it work? Um, does it do the same thing for other effects? We know 
uh, polyphosphate is involved in biofilm formation? Is that also the mechanism it's involved, how it can um, induce blood clotting? Those are the questions, but given the simplicity of the structure, we think that this is what, there's one underlying mechanism by which polyphosphate does all these various functions. With that, I would like to thank the people who did the work. I showed you uh, C. elegance work, which was done by Daniela Knöfler, who did the hyper measurements, and Michael Thompson, who did the, poly, uh, who did the oxycat measurements, and Nicholas and Minuki is helping us with the, the warm sorter. I showed you a little bit about HSP33, which was worked by Dana, Claudia, Marianne, and Jeanette. The bleach in polyphosphate was almost exclusively done by Mike Gray, a very uh, talented postdoc who will be on the job market fairly soon, and a graduate student, Vinny, and three undergraduates that helped uh, doing some of the biophysical measurements. And then, of course, I would like to thank our collaborators, um, Union Biometrica, and of course, our funding agency, and you for your attention. Thank you very much. So now I have to put them on no longer mute. Mute. Okay. So. Oh, oh that's uh, funny. So you We're are online mute. now. We are yeah. on mute. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> hey, so um, uh, the, it's known that uh, in C. elegans, uh, when the, the, that the mitochondria go through two phases of, of expansion uh, during larval development. And uh, one of those is at the L3, L4 boundary. And then the biggest one is at the L4 to young adult boundary. And uh, we, many years ago, uh, were working with the GST4 GFP reporter, which originally was published by Chris Link as an oxidative stress marker. And that reporter uh, boots up big time at that L4 boundary. And uh, so that my suspicion is that's what you're looking at there is actually mitochondrial expansion. Yes, that, that's, that could easily be. That could easily be. But um, the question is now how this affects actually, what processes are affected by that? And is that enough to, to um, affect lifespan? So in the, in, the bunch of, in the bunch of proteins that you pulled out, that were in the 40 proteins that were oxidative stress sensitive, were they all mitochondria? I noticed there are many mitochondrial proteins in there. There were, hmm, I think there was certainly not an overrepresentation of mitochondrial proteins, but I can, I can have a look back at that um, in terms of redox sensitivity. We know from yeast that mitochondrial proteins are actually underrepresented when we look at redox sensitive proteins. But I think the, okay. the number of proteins was just too small that we reproducibly identified in all these replicates at all these different stages that we could make any major conclusion. In yeast, okay. we had 400 proteins and 100, and we enriched for mitochondrial proteins. So we are, there we could definitely make that conclusion that mitochondrial proteins are actually less, seem to be less sensitive to oxidation. But I wouldn't say anything about the elegance because we just, our, our sample size is just too small. Okay, but the way you do those yeast experiments is gonna depend on whether they're on uh, glucose or whether they're past the dioxic shift, right? Absolutely, absolutely. And in this case, they were all at an, oh, when we did those experiments, we did them all before the di dioxic shift. Yeah, and then the last question for you. Uh, one thing that's always uh, uh, perplexed me is the formation of the calcium phosphate uh, uh, inside of, in the matrix of the mitochondria. And have you, when you were doing your polyphosphate experiments, and you said you tested many, um, many um, ion, uh, anions, did you, have, did you actually take a look at calcium phosphate and see if that actually has a chaperone-like function, just out of interest? We did not test cal So we do everything in phosphate buffer. Yep. But we have not supplemented our phosphate buffer with calcium. So if there's any calcium in the comes in, then it's probably complex. We know that we need ions, divalent cations for polyphosphate to work. 
Um, so we cannot strip them with EDTA. That would uh, diminish the saffron activity if we add too much uh, divalent cations that will also affect the saffron activity. But we are just now at the process of starting to look what are the ions and uh, the cations? What can we, how can we manipulate that to really figure out what's going on? But yes, I'm, I, it, I think it's either calcium or manganese or magnesium, but we have not just tested calcium phosphate. Hmm. So it would make a, 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 make a lot of sense because when you form, when you're sinking in calcium into the matrix of the mitochondria, I, I believe that, say, uh, ATP dependent process, right? I think it's coming in on, on, on a transporter. And so you, you're essentially chewing up the, uh, I presume you're chewing up your ATP stores. So it would be a yin and yang kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's easy enough to test. I mean, we tested just various poly anions because we wanted to know is it just a simple, lots of DNA-like poly anions that, that uh, bring the bring ion, um, cations to the, to the protein and with that change the local charge and either the pH or the ionic strength around the protein. But again, what is really, what is really fascinating is that all those processes are incredibly chain length dependent. So which also speaks against the fact that it's a, a simple uh, association reaction. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, just a moment. Should I turn you down a little? Over there? I've got you off now. Oh, okay. Okay, here we go. No, we have not looked at um, lipids or DNA. No, I mean, we should... But it was already complicated enough doing all the redox proteomics that we have. No, but we should. Yes, yeah. I agree. But we have not done that. Well, in yeast, it looks that way because we, we had a fourth of our proteins were yeast, were mitochondrial proteins. Of the 400 protein thiols that we could reproducibly identify, 100 were mitochondrial proteins. And I think we found two or three of those mitochondrial proteins to respond to exogenous H2O2 treatment. And we found many, many more, about t roughly 10% of the cytosolic proteins. So are they better protected? Are they less stable? You know, I mean, we only, we look at 20 minutes after the peroxide treatment. So you can always argue, well, it gets up and then gets much more rapidly detoxified. But we were looking at stable oxidative modification. Well, I can't tell you for H2O2. For hypochlorous acid, it is so reactive with the proteins that it just no reactive species actually ever, ever gets to the DNA. So this is at least what we think. So because it, it will affect the lipids, it will affect every, I mean, with H2O2, of course, you see mutagenesis rates go up with H2O2. Um, but again, we haven't done it in C. elegans, um, and we haven't really spent too much time looking into that. So, I guess I have a twofold. In your developmental studies with the hydrogen, um, how do you know that that increase in hyperoxidation is actually due to more reactive oxygen species, not uh, a reduction of lower level styles of the calcium? And if you think about yeah. yeah. Okay, good. That's an excellent question, and I should clarify that. I mean, it has to get oxidized by H2O2 to form the disulfide bond. But yes, there's gluteroreduction that has been shown to be very specific in reducing that. And yes, it could also be that it's a combination, that we have higher H2O2 levels and or lower 
activity levels of glutaridoxin. But at the end of the day, it will end up with the same outcome that the proteins that get oxidized by the presence of H2O2 will stay oxidized either because there's constantly H2O2 being made that shifts the equilibrium or because there is less GRX around that can reduce it. But no, we cannot distinguish between those two scenarios. But the end result is the same, that the proteins get oxidized. Sure. Follow-up question. So with your U.S. biomics approach, um, indicates in your model with the hydrogen peroxide, if you say a protein is less sensitive, how do you know, how do you distinguish whether that is due to the fact that it's closer to the cell surface? It tends to probably see the higher concentration of hydrogen peroxide versus one that is deeper in the cell and actually see a lot less. Yes. I mean, that's, of course, a possibility that the H2O2 never makes it into the mitochondria when we treat them exogenously um, in yeast cells. Um, we did do this uh, bioinformatic analysis with yeast. And again, because we had a much bigger pool of proteins. And we looked at the 400 protein thiols that we identified. We look where they are in the proteins for which crystal structures or NMR structures were available. And we, could, and we looked at the isoelectric point for those where we could predict it. There was nothing that correlated with how, whether these proteins are stably oxidized except one thing, if there was another cysteine nearby. If there was another cysteine nearby, that was clearly overrepresented. Now, I agree with you that I think, and again, it's this, it's these stable oxidative modifications that are not just coming and going. And I mean, the, it's going to be very, very difficult to ever see them. Um, so it, I would, I mean, Jakob Wint did this beautiful work where he showed how all these surface cysteines get oxidized in the presence of diamide. But I think they will get oxidized, but they will equally fast get reduced. Either they don't get oxidized or they get oxidized very quickly. So what we're really looking at is stable oxidative modifications such as these ribosomal proteins like GAP-DH, which is after 20 minutes, we see 80% of gap dh active site uh, still oxidized after H2O2 treatment. Does that answer your question? Um, did you say that five nanomolar to change it was like 80 micromolar? Nanomolar. Nanomolar. But it still means that there must be more than one, one uh, protein per chain because we know that, that even 75 nanomolar of luciferase aggregates very rapidly. So, so can you look at your genetics with that process to get insight I think, I mean, all we see is the aggregation is down with very low amounts of polyphosphate. I can only, and what we can do is we can add either PPK or PPX to this complex at 43 degrees and the polyphosphate gets degraded and the luciferase gets released and starts aggregating. So we can do all those things and play around. We have to find some type of structural tool to really visualize what's going on. I personally think that there are just more luciferous molecules binding onto one chain of the polyphosphate. But how and how this works, I mean, we don't see any light scattering. Um, we don't know yet. Could that um, be used possibly in overexpression of proteins in bacteria? Yes, and we are doing this right now because I want to have a BMW at some point, I decided. Um, we are doing this trying to figure out whether we can generally stabilize proteins. Because for luciferase, for instance, it's a very sensitive protein. Just add polyphosphate to luciferase, it has already twice the activity just by stabilizing it. And so this is what we're doing. We have cells that make more polyphosphate, have no polyphosphatase so that they really accumulate uh, polyphosphate, and we found a few proteins. For one protein, for instance, the expression level goes up, and the solubility of very soluble protein doesn't change, but the, just the yield goes up. And for the other one, the yield doesn't change much, but the solubility goes up. And so we are doing this now on a genome-wide. So you can't test in the media, Well, um, you can add it to the media. Uh, 
you can add it to the media. At some point, it becomes toxic because it makes pores. Um, we add it to the media when we do biofilm studies because it's also having to do with biofilm formation. So if you find low enough concentrations, I don't know how much of that protein uh, of the polyphosphate goes into into the cells. So we are trying this with C. elegans right now, feeding them on polyphosphate and strains that make more polyphosphate. So, but I don't know whether this will work, whether they take it up. Pardon me? Yes, polyphosphate is great. You can, uh, you can label it on both ends. So you can do all those biophysical methods to look at interactions. Yes, yes, you can biotinylate it. So it's really very, very cool, very ancient, the forgotten polymer. Ooh. <laughs> Yes. I mean, the, the, no. We do not, I mean, there are phosphatases known in eukaryotes, but there are no, the kinases are not known. Mm -hmm. It's found everywhere, but we still don't know what the, what the kinase is. But that's the nice thing because we use the PPK as a drug target because that's bacteria specific and that's known. Do the, um, I have to think about, is Shane here? Shane still there? Um, in the death too? I think from a, I, I have to tell you, I don't know whether we actually looked at that, how long they lay eggs. Yeah. Yes, so I mean, this is what we're doing now. This is what we're doing with the biosorters, where we sort them according to their ROS levels and then analyze in, in individual worms, what's their brood size? How long do they, do they lay eggs? Is there, do the, the offsprings, do they have a, a similar lifespan distribution at least? So this is what we are trying to do. But the problem is sorting them on an individual worm basis is not so trivial. Yeah, and I mean, I mean, there is, it's, it's, it's already known that, yeah, that reactive oxygen species and oxidative stresses plays a, plays a huge part in stem cells. And this is the, not the hyper worm that we are using, but the next generation uh, sensor. They have now mice, and they are starting to look at stem cells and looking at ROS levels in stem cells with using those ORP mice. Okay, thank you very much.